Um, it's just different. And of course, it's a different generation of people as well, you know, so I don't fault her or anything. Yeah, it's not about fault finding or people doing yeah. things wrong or right. It's about as you guys are are walking with people through grieving situations, being aware of what constitutes misinformation, right? Yeah. Um, I work with Marines, Marine families a lot. And so it's a I have to do a lot of psychoeducation with the Marines to get them to understand that actually allowing themselves to feel an emotion and lean into an emotion is actually strength. Being strong is not uh, denying how you feel about something, right? Your daddy just died, you know? And and it's like, I don't want to be strong. I want to fall apart. I want to mm-hmm. feel the depth of that loss. That's authentic. That's genuine. Being strong in terms of denying how we feel and not allowing other people to see us vulnerable is ne- is not necessarily strength. Right. You know, so when you're with somebody who's walking through that, you know, sometimes I'll tell people, you know what, it's okay to completely fall apart. And people just, the floodgates just open because there's no permission given to, to just feel the depth of the loss. And that goes for loss of a marriage, loss of a child. You know, it's a ama- Our culture is so, um, oh, I, I want to say kind of afraid of, of where our feelings might take us, right? Almost like if the floodgates open, they might never, sh- they might never close, right? And, and I think that that's, that's one way that we get robbed of uh, the wholeness of who we are as a human being, because we're created to have the, the depth and breadth of feeling that we have for a reason. And, you know, I mean, I love the fact that one of the ways we describe God is love. God is love. I mean, at the very essence of who we are, even God is described as the most intense feeling, right? And I think many of us come from backgrounds where feelings were not valued. They were not um, welcomed, right? Because they were intimate, kind of like what you're talking about, Susan. A feeling state was intimidating for a parent who didn't know how to manage or regulate their own feelings. And so all they really were left with was minimizing and sometimes even denying, right? And that doesn't make them horrible people. It just means that there was a limitation there that a lot of us are products of. And so it's important to change the narrative in our own minds, especially if we're doing grief work, that feelings are to be valued and welcomed and honored. And and we need to help people move toward how they feel, regardless of, of how um, unmanageable it might feel. Right. And maybe even just to, I was just thinking as I was reading the chapter and stuff this week that, um, we need to be the safe place because people, like you said, they're afraid of their feelings. They've maybe other events have happened that are grieving, like they've lost a job or something before a bigger one, so to speak. And then they have these feelings, but they don't have a safe place to go to, to show them because they need to be strong for their family or whoever's told them that or whatever. Anyway, I I just keep thinking about so many children when I worked in the school setting, how many changes happened. And our school that I was working in were very sensitive to kids that moved a lot and were transient. They had lots of foster kids. And so, you know, a lot of change, a lot of movement going on in their lives and the kids living in the cars and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we're all taught to be very sensitive about that. But, you know, all of this kind of stuff, they, they never had dealt with those emotions those kids must be having. And so the kids acted out and that's what they dealt with instead of these emotions. And I think even adults act out 
because they don't have a safe place to feel the emotions. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the thing that's so interesting is that, you know, we can deploy all the other coping mechanisms that we do to get through our life that we've learned from very young, whether it's all the stirbs, keeping busy, um, whether it's making sense logically out of things that happen. And if we can just make enough logical sense out of something, then we learn not to feel something about it because our heads, you know, our cognitive ability has taken us so far, right? So my point is that the coping mechanisms that we implement, they only take us to a certain point. And then usually when there is, is significant loss, traumatic loss, none of those coping mechanisms work anymore. And so I, I call it the gift of grief because really in the grieving process, you have, you get the gift of yourself because you're, you're almost forced to, um, to deal with yourself emotionally in a way that maybe you've never had to. And that's why it's so important to have a safe place because this is new for people and it's terrifying. And so we want to help people uh, not feel like they have to be in fear so that they can give themselves permission to feel what they feel. Now, the reason being able to feel what we feel is important is because we can't complete a loss until we're authentic and honest about how we feel, right? So it's those, those elements are connected. So we cannot complete a loss until we're authentic and honest about how we feel. And um, in my case, with the loss of my marriage, I had to deal with a lot of uh, intense anger, right? And I realized I had been angry from a very, very, very young age that didn't have anything to do with my marriage, right? My dad was pretty harsh when I was growing up and I was pretty afraid of him. And so, and I, but, and I never understood why I couldn't, it was, if I got angry, I was sent to my room and told I could come out when I, when I didn't feel angry anymore. But it was okay for them to, my dad to explode all over the place and anger was okay for him. So I was very confused about the emotion of anger. So the reason I'm talking about this is because that thread kind of continued as I did my grief work in the loss of my marriage, because I could see that the anger was something I wasn't willing to own and I wasn't willing to accept about myself, that I was angry, right? I mean, you look at the, at the outside, it's like, well, of course you're angry, right? But I couldn't allow myself to feel my anger because I was a Christian. It wasn't okay to feel angry. Somehow I was going to be less loving or less gracious if I allowed myself to be angry, right? So you can see how a lot of that misinformation kind of embeds itself as we do this work. And so it was important to go back. And that's Brenda, that's why I asked you about which relationship to, to process, because really the relationship I ended up processing early on was the loss of, was the relationship with my dad. Because that was the foundational piece that I could be more authentic about. And once I was able to sort of complete that loss. And it was a loss of a hope, dream, or expectation with what I wished I would have had with a dad. Right. And it was very confusing because my dad was a great guy. He was always there. He, you know, as when he became a Christian, when I was in junior high, he, a lot of things changed about him, but still there was some injury there emotionally when I was a little girl that I wasn't able to like move through. So I was able to process 
that loss of that hope, dream, or expectation that I wanted, you know, the daddy that I, I wished I could have had, but it, and it wasn't, and it wasn't that he was a bad person. He just had limitations because of his own upbringing, right? So that's the way it works. So we learn how to be gracious and loving, but it, that doesn't mean that we don't honestly take stock of, of the disappointments and the losses. We can do both. But I think sometimes we're so busy, we have our head down and we're just trying to do life, right? That we leave ourselves behind, right? And we we kind of shatter into different pieces. And that's kind of what this whole process is, right? It's We call it in the therapy world, we call it integration, right? Where we're picking up all the pieces that kind of got scattered and there be we become more and more and more whole again. And, um, and that's why going back to the foundation of which loss I think was most significant for me at the time was important to grieve my dad so that I could complete that loss so that I could move on and have a, a relationship that was, uh, that was in the here and now. And I wasn't carrying all this hurt from the past, right? Which is the goal. The goal is to complete the loss, which requires authenticity and honesty about your feelings. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. A lot of that sounds like what you're talking about uh, in my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, it'll be interesting to go back and see. Yeah. Where some of that where to start with it. It's right now it's like, oh, that's overwhelming. <laughs> it is. It is overwhelming. And 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 I think that's why the loss history graph is so powerful because it gives you a snapshot of of the history of your losses in your life, right? And and sometimes sometimes the loss history graph highlights, yep, that's the one I need to grieve, right? Like you know, like for you, Ron, the the loss of your daughter, right? Yep. That's it. There's no question about it. Right. But for others of us, depending on what it is you're grieving, it can be more deeply embedded. And so that's the thing you want to focus on. So the reason that I'm talking about this is because the next step is to look at your lost history graph and decide which loss is the most significant for you to process as we go into the next phase of what we're doing. Okay. And so the difference between the loss history graph, and then we're going to do another graph. It's called a relationship graph. Okay. So this is your relationship um, with, with respect to your, either your loved one, or the relationship or the circumstance that was, that represented the loss of a hope, dream, or expectation, right? In my case, it was my marriage. So, so what I want you to do next is I want you to take the loss that you've chosen to process, and you're going to do a relationship graph that is specific toward that relationship with your loved one. Now, if you've already done that and you kind of focused on just the relationship when we were doing the lost history, that's okay, because this graph is going to look a little different, okay? And they do a really good job in the book of explaining it, but um, um, in the relationship, as in all relationships, there's, there are positive and negative interactions and memories, right? You know, even even with, um, you know, the most perfect child, there's going to be negative memories, <laughs> right? So now what you're going to do is you're going to do the same kind of graph, but, you know, you have a line, and then above the line, you're going to chart positive memories and you can make the length of the line can indicate how intense 
the memory is, how intense the emotion is toward that memory. Okay. So if it's long, it's a really intense emotional response. If it's a little shorter, maybe not so much. Okay. And then on the below the line, it's going to indicate a negative experience or memory. Does that make sense? And it's the same thing. It'll be the length of the line will determine the intensity of the emotional experience. Okay, so you're conceivably you're going to have a line and then you're going to have, you know, marks above it with notations of which memory you're think you're reminded of. And then you're going to have tick marks along the bottom with negative memories. You're not dishonoring anyone by remembering things that were negative in terms of your interaction with them. When we lose someone, it's natural to, I call it deification, right? Where we deify people so that, you know, they're next to God in terms of their, their holiness and goodness, right? But no human is, is that good, right? On the converse, you know, it's okay to look at the negative aspects as well as, and then as the, we don't want to vilify them either. I'm so glad that person's gone out of my life because that so-and-so, right? Right. Even with my ex-husband, right? It's like, you know, I don't want to vilify him or be tempted to feel those feelings because the goal is to complete the loss. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about them not being responsible for what they've done or whatever, right? It's about us being able to complete the emotional connection that we have where, when we get triggered. So, so that's the next step is to do the relationship graph. And then after you do the relationship graph, we're going to use that to complete the loss. And there are some exercises we're going to do. So this is a really important part. Um, when we get together again in two weeks, I'm not going to ask you to share your relationship graph like we did the loss history right? Um, because I want to, I want to really honor and respect your process. And I feel like you guys can be more honest and authentic within your own heart. If you, if this is more private, does that make sense? So I am going to ask you how the process is going and, um, get your feedback, but I'm not going to ask you to go into detail and share it the way I did with the loss history. Okay. So this one's your lost relationship. Anybody have questions? No? Okay. Good. I really want you guys to, to allow yourself to have as many memories um, for the positive and the negative as you can. Try to really spend some time on this, even if you set aside, you know, an hour a day and work on it, because what will happen is um, your brain will begin to feel more comfortable going there. And so it's going to be natural for you guys to have more and more memories to fill in in between um, as things come up, because you're sort of priming the pump and it in most loss is pretty traumatic. So when your brain feels comfortable going there, it's like sometimes the floodgates get opened and it's like, oh, I forgot about that. I forgot about that too. Right. And so you have more and more um, memories that come up. The goal is to complete the relationship. And so the more detail you can put into your graph, the better. Right. So give yourself this gift of of um, processing um, in a very concrete, tangible way. If you find yourself getting triggered, um, can you can anybody tell me um, 
when you start to get triggered um, in terms of your trauma, are you familiar with yourself to know uh, when it's too much, like when something is too overwhelming for you, like what happens? Like sometimes people, they get a sore throat or they get a, you know, their stomach gets upset or their hands begin to sweat or their jaw begins to clench. Um, for me, I get a headache. <laughs> That's just kind of my thing. So do you guys have any kind of things that happen for you guys when, when you start to get a little overwhelmed? Ace, what about you? Um, yeah, I think um, what I used to do uh, more so uh, in the past, when I say the past, I guess maybe going back uh, from three years ago up until maybe uh, just a few months ago, but uh, just replaying things in my head and um, becoming angry uh, at those things again, you know. Uh, yeah. But one thing that you mentioned today that maybe I didn't uh, consider before was leaning into those feelings, you know, um, when I was uh, very lonely at that time, I, uh, I actually had some really great songs that came out of those lonely, uh, yeah, thematically, they would sound like a country song, but it was uh, more my thing was kind of pop songs for your younger generation, you know, but uh, I guess maybe it helped me to kind of lean into it without becoming really angry it's kind of a way of uh maybe getting it out you know yes so that's what it, yeah it kind of it kind of felt like that mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so the physical sensation when you would get angry what would happen in your body I, I would feel angry uh like uh like I did I guess I would say you know I would think negative things negative thoughts against uh, uh that person if I was remembering something that offended me uh, and so I would uh, become angry again, and I would, I think I would toss myself back into my work instead of um, when I found myself there and uh, angry, uh, I would say, okay, let's, let's get to work, you know, we got things to do. So I would go okay. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my guess is that, does that come from, was it okay to be angry when you were little? Uh, when we were little, no, uh, coming from, because uh, for the first few years of uh, my life and my brothers and uh, sister, we uh, we were all born here in the Philippines. Uh, so culturally, uh, you don't show, uh, I guess in our culture, we don't show those kind of uh, emotions. I think like kind of Su Susan was uh, saying about um, a figure that maybe she learned from. So I, I kind of learned from that. Uh, we kind of learned from that. You don't really show emotions. Uh, you don't get angry. Uh, and so I think um, a lot of the times when we were younger, we bottled things inside, you know, uh, until to the point that maybe it had to explode, you know. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you can kind of see that thread, kind of like what I was sharing, right? Like, oh, mm -hmm. anger's not okay. So I better just work harder or keep myself distracted because it's not okay to feel angry. And, right. you know, it's interesting. I feel like whenever we, uh, shame ourselves for feeling a certain way or avoid a certain thing. It's like, we're really like missing out on really important parts of ourselves that need some attention. So, um, yeah. And so for you, it's like that perseverating, right? Like it's like, it goes into your head and then it just gets on a loop for you and it's hard for you to get out of that loop. So that for you is your signal that I'm overwhelmed. There's too much going on here. And so, yeah, so it's a cognitive process for you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I think part of that too, Ace, is like you're going in kind of that trauma mode. Remember I talked about how you're flipping your lid, right? That fight, flight, or freeze part of your brain is taking over. And that's why the, that's why it's perseverating. It's trying to find a solution to an unfair dynamic. And it just is going round and round and round, right? So the way to keep your brain, the way to find other solutions is to get your brain, the, cog, the frontal lobe back online so that you can think clearly, right? And the way you do that is by deep breathing. Effectively deep breathing, not just deep breathing, breath, but slow, deep breaths, getting that heart rate down, and then your brain can come back online and it will stop this trauma response. 
that's cycling. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody else? What do you guys, what happens to you when you know you're overwhelmed emotionally? What about you, Ron? Like you said earlier, I, I get a headache mm. if, if it's overwhelming to me, and then I have to focus on something else, you know, not think about, you know, what gave me the headache to begin with. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my go to. And it's funny because my husband always says, Oh, there's something going on. You've got a headache. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's interesting because when I went through the hardest time of my own trauma, um, it manifested in migraines. So it's the only time I've ever had migraines. And, but that's, so I know for me that that's definitely what that, that's my indicator is when I get a headache, cause you don't want it to go to a migraine. So yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Cheryl, what about you? Hello. So um, I get headaches too. Well, I used to get them real bad. I used to have bad migraines, but um, it gets better. Um, I don't get them as much. And um, I was just thinking of sitting here thinking about it when you said it. Um, I do think, and I didn't notice to now, but I think illness. Mm -hmm. I'll get sick or, you know, don't feel good or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 And this is where it's like, the reason I'm talking about this is because as you guys do your graph and it becomes, um, as your brain begins to think of things that, maybe you hadn't thought about in a really long time. Um, I want you to pay attention to what your body is telling you because I want you to do this, but I also want you to take care of yourselves. And I don't want you to push yourself to the point where you feel like uh, your self-care is being compromised, right? So I want you to pay attention to what you're feeling as you're going through this process. And I want you to value that, right? This exercise is not about completing, you know, a pen and paper exercise. This is about emotionally you being able to come out on the other side of something healthier and freeing up more space for yourself so that, so that you can have more to give to yourself and other people. So, and then as you're learning how to do that, obviously you're going to be more equipped to help other people too, right? So self-care is vitally important in this process, because if you're not taking care of yourself, it's going to be really hard to be helpful to other people because you want to be that model. You want to be that role model. And it's really hard to be grounded and present with someone when you're not taking good care of yourself, right? Um, you know, for a therapist, this is like, this is the thing they beat into you, you know, <laughs> like every single class that you take, self-care, 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 because, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be much help to anybody else. And you're not going to bring that authentic, um, genuine part of who you are into the room, right? Um, you're more than a warm body sitting across from that person that you're ministering to, or you're holding up, right? And so it's, it's only fair to them as well that they get the, the healthy present, you know, part of you that can really walk with them. But if you're depleted and just struck and just hanging on with your fingernails, right? Emotionally, it's really, really hard to be um, helpful to other people. So I'm going to go ahead and do a check-in.
Um, yes, just a second, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy? Uh -huh. uh, Brenda Veasley had a question. Her hand was up. Oh, go ahead, Brenda. Yep, you go first. Oh, all I was going to do is just uh, put some input on the question that you asked from the beginning. As for me, I get tired and sleepy all uh -huh. the time. That's when I know something is going on mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what I do is I'll go to sleep, but at the same time, I have to pray and ask God, what is it that's really bothering me right now? Yes. And so yeah. that's yeah. one of the things that I do. Yeah. Tired. Yeah. I mean, I drag. I'm like, something's wrong. What's on my mind? What's eating at me right now? Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you, Brenda. That's me too. I usually get tired and then I get a headache. <laughs> so it's, it's like, no, this isn't working because I'm, you know, I'm just as tempted to avoid stuff as anybody else. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So check in with me, Brenda, talk to me about how you're doing overall and um, in like what check in and let us know kind of where you feel like you're at with all of this um with my graph if i be honest i haven't put a whole lot of energy into it this week because i'm on vacation <laughs> well where are you at home uh, i'm sitting here in atlanta looking out this beautiful at this beautiful view <laughs> nice well, yeah. that's, that's the perfect um, self-care, you know, uh, intervention. That's awesome. Yeah, but I, I did look over it and uh, I didn't really come up with, uh, uh, I looked at chapter 10, that's where I went to uh, mm -hmm. chapter 10. And um, I didn't really come up with anything just yet okay. uh, uh, as far as the graph is concerned, but I am going to go back over it and see if anything you know triggers me or anything like that okay um, and make sure so. when you do when you do your graph i think i i know you came on i'm not sure when you came in um but, but go back and listen to the recording because this graph is a little different in terms mm -hmm. of how we do it so you know with the positive uh, memories mm -hmm. on the top and then the negative on the bottom so. oh i heard you Oh, you did. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was on. <laughs> oh, you were. Okay. All right. Awesome. So, so Brenda, how do you take care of yourself besides go on vacation? When you're at home, uh, what do you do? Oh, when I'm home, mm -hmm. uh, do what I want to when I want to <laughs> You just uh, do whatever you want to do? I just do what I want to do. Okay. Um, Okay. No, seriously, if uh, if I want to stay home all day, I stay home all day. Uh, if I stay home too much, I say, wait a minute, I need to get out for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I'll go I'll go shopping, but not to buy. I'll just go looking just to get out of the house. Um, now, ministry keeps me really busy. <sighs> like next Wednesday, I might not be on here because I think I have to teach Bible study. But um, I do a lot with ministry. I work with the, uh, not just church, but I work with uh, a women's ministry as well. And I really enjoy doing that. Um, as for me, I pamper myself when I feel like I need pampering. Letting that's like every other week. Okay. Um, but I do do things, I'm learning to do things for myself. Because in the past, I did for everyone else. Even the financial planner said, you need to do something for you. Stop spending your money on everybody else. And uh, he, he was right, because that's just my life. I always do for everybody else, but I never did for me. And so that's why I'm in Atlanta right now, because I always wanted to travel. But... Uh, I didn't do it for so many reasons. I have a granddaughter that's 21 years old. I had her from the day that she was born. Okay, the second day I brought her home from the hospital. And so I became a mother again. Mm -hmm. um, 
I have a son that's 45 that I can't explain. I'm not going to go into all of that right now. We're just going to pray for him. But uh, I still deal with him a lot. He's diabetic. Uh, I think I shared earlier with you all that it's more like when I retired, I became a caregiver for my son, for my daughter, for my cousin, who's like my brother. You know, people at church need something. Go take food, go pick up the seniors, go do this. But I have decided that's not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. It's about me now. I have more days behind me than I do ahead of me. And do, do you feel like part of that shift was your realization that um, people, you don't have to do things for everybody else for people to stay with you and love you? Repeat the question. Do you feel like part of that shift was your realization that people are going to stay with you and love you no matter what, even if you don't do so much for them? Oh, I, I never felt like they didn't love me or anything like that. I think it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. I cared so much about them and uh, showed them so much love, you know. Mm -hmm. No, no. The answer to the question is no. Okay. Okay. No. Fair enough. Mm -mm. Awesome. No. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, But I'm learning how to take care of me. That's awesome. We're proud yes. of you. Thank you. Because <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> what about you, Cheryl? How do you take care of yourself? And how are you doing with this whole process? Um, I'm loving the whole process. <laughs> it's, um, I think it's very beneficial to me, even even when going through the um, graph that I was doing, a lot of emotions came up, but I think it still was therapeutic. And then uh, by me being able to um, share, I take whatever I'm processing and I take it to my um, support group about myself and then I have them do some of the same things mm. so, yeah it's it's going well and for me um like Brenda I love absolutely love love pampering myself so I have to go get some orange nails every now and then <laughs> <laughs> at least two every two weeks two to three weeks um yeah, I love going shopping. And then um, I enjoy spending, it's a, we have like a, a girls group, my sisters and cousins, we all get together for each one's birthday and um, go out of town or whatever. And so I enjoy that a lot too. Just some time to get away, to get out of Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Can I can I ask a question? <laughs> yes, of course. To Cheryl. You're from Lubbock? Yes, ma'am. My dad lived in Lubbock all his life. Really? High pocket. <laughs> I have really? a sister there named Erica Dawson. Oh my goodness. Enola yes. Gay Dawson. Yes. Gary Dawson. And uh, a couple others. Yes. Yeah, small world. It is. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So you said it's it's um it's been helpful to for your group as well. Are you implementing some of the stuff that we've been doing with them as as well? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> and it, and it's helpful to them. They're finding. Yes. yes, and at first I was gonna wait to um you know, to I go all the way through and then implement some stuff. But I just thought the um, the timeline, mm -hmm. that just really seemed to help. And I, I'm thankful to God that it was kind of like confirmation to me to go ahead and do it with them. Mm -hmm. And it's helping a lot. 
Right. And, you know, you'll, it's, I think it's really cool because you'll, uh, you'll kind of find your own rhythm with it, right? Like your own flavor of how you communicate and what, you know, what translates, because again, it's part of the authenticity and honesty from your perspective, not only your own story, but, but your ability to walk with others. So, you know, obviously my perspective is more therapeutic per se, because that's sort of my lens. Right. Mm -hmm. But but each person has their own beautiful, wonderful gift Mm -hmm. in working with people who are grieving. And my, my, my firm belief is that the people that God brings to you will be the people that need specifically need you and your your background, your story, your cultural influence, right? And I can't, I can't work with the people that God brings to you because he's brought them to you for a reason, right? Right. And I think that's so incredible how that works. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you. All right. Okay, Brenda, what about you? How do you take care of yourself? And tell me about your process with uh, like kind of where we're at in terms of almost kind of halfway there, a little over halfway. Um, I, I kind of isolate sometimes. Um, good self-care. I try to get around people though, because I get out of the house and go around others and, you know, get a different perspective going again. And, um, and sometimes I have my nails done and, uh, sometimes I will, so I'll just go do a project, you know, with the embroidery machine. And, um, and I wrote a note as far as this class to, Make the most of this class because I don't feel like I've done that yet. Mm. I've allowed other things. And also we had tremendous wind for a couple of weeks and dirt in the air. And so allergies, you know, I don't function (laughs) well when the allergies are overwhelming. And so, yeah. Um, So, yeah, I really, I want to do this because I really feel like this is a major thing you know a a wonderful way to deal with this and I've shared it with uh, a client and she bought three books and now she 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 wants to give me three books so I can have yeah one for myself and 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 others to share because uh, she thought a lot of it and I kind of just freeze. (laughs) I do more of the freeze than the fight or flight. And, you know, uh, Brenda, it's interesting listening to you, right? Because I can hear that, that shame narrative, even in the background Mm. of what you're talking about, like somehow I'm not doing enough or somehow I'm not taking advantage of this enough. Like, like kind of that, you know, I can hear that narrative going on <laughs> that's even in the background. And I want to encourage you that you're doing fine. You're doing enough. You're doing mm. enough. You know, it. this is not the type of, of work that you have to cross all your T's and dot all your I's, you know, or read every single chapter or every you're here and you're, you know, when you can be, and you've been here. And I just want to encourage you not to allow that, that narrative that somehow, you know, you're missing something because you are doing enough and you're involved in this process and it's a safe place to do that. So I want to encourage you. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You you nailed it. (laughs) Like, and when you said, you know, give yourself some time and maybe an hour each day and it's like, Ooh, (laughs) you know, that felt like a a lot. 
Yeah. And you know, and I think that's where you being able to value how you feel about this process is important. It's okay for you to go, no, Kathy, that's way too much. I'm giving myself five minutes and Mm. that's going to be good enough. (laughs) Right. Not that somehow, because you didn't follow some kind of protocol that it's that somehow, you know, you're falling short because that's not the case. That's just the narrative that's familiar to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Precious. Right. Susan, how do you take care of yourself and tell me where you're at in terms of kind of halfway through this process? Well, I um, love to pamper myself and all those uh, nails and hair and all those things. I'm a girly girl, even though I have a tomboy part of my life. I love all that girl stuff. I love shopping, all those things. I love decorating and fixing my house up and all that stuff is really fun for me. Going antiquing or looking in junk stores, thrift stores is what I love the most. So that's very relaxing. But you know, if I can't or don't feel like I need to do spend any money, I love to go for a walk or sit on the porch. I love to sit on my porch. I love to read. I love to, and I've just gotten, I love to listen to audible books and walk and pray. I love all those things. So to me that if I can get a minute away, I love to do any of those kind of things. If I don't want to spend any money. Um, and I am loving this process, as you know, I've talked to you about it after, um, that the timeline is a gift to anyone that can do that. I, I just, I agree with Cheryl. It's just, it was so eye-opening and so healing for me, even that, just that step of looking at kind of the bigger picture and seeing what hasn't been dealt with. And that was just a gift and awareness. Um, I've told many people about it and, you know, it's just, so, and I've I've thought a lot about it because of course the homework, we need to think and trying to really remember any misinformation or this or that. So I just thought about it a lot and I think, and because of that, I thought of my daddy and thought of all the situation and everything that happened and, um, I have been grieving him. And so it's just been so good for me. It's just been really, really good. So I don't know what else to say, my dear. It was great. (laughs) Good. Good. What about you, Ron? How do you take care of yourself? Well, one way is um, I've been... I like washing cars. Uh, I've been washing cars since I was 12. Uh, I started out washing them for my uncles and and, uh, men around who had cars just so I could drive them. (laughs) (laughs) And so now, um, if I feel like just uh, clearing my head, I'll go to the car wash and clean up one of the cars, you know? feel a whole lot better. Um, that uh, and fishing. Mm-hmm. When I get the opportunity to go fishing, I go fishing. Um, I like uh, smoking meat on the barbecue pit. You know, I've kind of mastered it now. I'm going to say I mastered it, but you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I go to the, I go to the, a uh, nail shop or spa or whatever with my wife and get my feet did, you know. <laughs> <Good for you. laughs> yeah. I used to have something against men who showed up at the places with their wives, but I enjoy it, you know. <laughs> uh, don't get my hands done, but just my feet. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm enjoying the, the process of this class. Uh, so much so to where I um, offered it up to my ex-wife, uh, my, my daughter's mother. Uh, but unfortunately, she's not ready yet. Yeah. She, she's not ready yet. She's still, she's still angry. 
And, um, and so she uh, revealed to me, she texted me yesterday morning and um, asked about the class because I mentioned it to her the week before. And she just said she didn't want, she wasn't ready to just talk about it, you know, people and stuff. So, cause I told her this is what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's still angry. And she mentioned to me that she was angry with God. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so in the process of that, God was able to, able to give me things to say to her. I was on the phone with her for about an hour and a half, and I haven't talked to her that long since we were together many, many years ago. But God was steady pouring out, and, and it wasn't a beat over the head with God type deal, you know? I noticed that God, if you, if you make yourself available to God, God will use you to get whatever message it is that he wants to get out. And uh, he got the message out to her, and um no it was the day before so yesterday uh since my daughter didn't have either one of us as beneficiary on her bank account or her um life insurance policy on her job and my daughter's not married and doesn't have children um we were i was able to pick up my ex-wife and uh, my daughter's little sister yesterday and take them while we went and got some papers notar uh, notarized mm -hmm. so that she can, you know, uh, get the start the process of the bank, the, the money that's in the bank and the uh, insurance policy. Mm -hmm. So that's a big step for her, you know, yeah. before she wasn't able to deal with it. And now she's coming around a little better. And mm -hmm. um, we had a good time and uh, we laughed about it because her sister was like, well, um, you, you, um, if Bree was if Bree, Bree was here, she would say, "You can't ride with my daddy. What you ride with my daddy for? You know." <laughs> <laughs> she was the baddest girl, you know. And we kind of laughed about it. And I said, "Well, Bree, is, she's still bringing bringing people together, you know." So oh. that was a good experience for me yesterday. So oh. <laughs> I thought I shared it. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's Isn't it. that, that is so amazing how there can be restoration, you know, in something that's so horrible, you know, I mean, to see something positive come out of it, Amen. you know, that's, that's really, that's, I'm so glad you shared that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks but, for allowing me to. <laughs> my guess is nobody looks at you cross-eyed when you walk into the nail salon. <laughs> they make the, they look, some of the Asians, some of the guys in there, the, the guy that owns the place or whatever, he'll make a joke and ask me, what color do I want my nails? <laughs> I say, you're not touching my hands. <laughs> Tell him orange. Uh, yes. <laughs> look, I had to get some orange and get some purple. <laughs> that's right <laughs> i might try that <laughs> that's so funny so my what kind of car is your favorite car to drive um right now i have a, a 1977 chevy Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. and <laughs> i probably shouldn't have gotten it but i was told that if you're gonna because i'm trying to get into the classic car business uh-huh and so I was uh, doing some research and they said, get something that you enjoy. And I can tell you over my life, I've had three of, this is my third one. And I think I've enjoyed it too much because I've had it for two years. <laughs> and I was supposed to have been selling the thing a year and a half ago, so. What color is it? It's uh, like a beige color, uh, tan with swivel seats. Nice. I, I seen some pictures of it. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see pictures of it. I seen some pictures of it. <laughs> My husband would love that. <laughs> Tell awesome. him it's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Okay, Ace, what about you? How do you take care of yourself and 
Tell me where you're at with this process. I'm doing good so far. You know, I'm pleased for, with where I am. I'm feeling the healing uh, coming in. And I think I'm just uh, um, the opportunity to just be able to express it, get it out, uh, helps uh, a lot with the, with the healing, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, but I guess coming from that place where I was before, that the attitude, especially over the pandemic, was to isolate myself and go into work. So now I've kind of uh, see it as an opportunity to rest the body, kind of rest the mind, rest the heart, rest the soul. So I'm just um, trying to get that rest in and not to be so stacked so high with my to-do list. So it's been helping a lot. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kenva, are you still with us? I'm here. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> how are you doing with this process and how do you take care of yourself um well um i'm i i like to to plan for myself too i don't really do my nails and stuff or go to the salon um i do my own hair and but i do like to to do shopping and stuff like that and by, you know, just by things that I'm interested in or things that I like for myself is one way to do it. The other thing I really like to do is to be in nature when I can. And now that spring is kind of here in the Houston area, it's much warmer than it is, I guess, in other parts of Texas right now. Today we had like, I think it was like in the seventies or so. So it was nice. And so in my backyard, one of the things I did to pamper myself was I got a, it's kind of like a hammock chair. And so I just like to sit in my hammock chair and sit in the yard and just relax. And that's one of the things I like to do. That's, that's just relaxing to me. Mm -hmm. With the process, um, I've done the graph the way it's done in the book. I kind of focused when, when we shared about the loss graph, I focused on my mom and I figured I would start with that. Um, I've gone through things. I've looked at the disturbs and the illnesses and the accidents and stuff. And I'm not so sure if I'm feeling the way I'm supposed to feel. And I don't even know if there is a way that you're supposed to feel. <laughs> nope. um, there no, right? Okay. That's I no. I, 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 I mean, it's, it's done me a lot of good. Um, I don't, I, I, and it's, this is very awkward to say because my mom's loss is probably one of the most painful losses of my life, but I almost feel like doing the graph is showing me that I am already starting to heal from it, kind of. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's why I feel like, well, should I be more emotional? Should I be crying? Should I, mm. I don't know, you know, it's kind of awkward to say that, but um, we did have some good times together. And I think that's kind of why I feel that way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why, you know, at the front of the book, at the big, very beginning, it basically says each relationship is so unique, right? And it's possible that because you had the relationship you did with your mom, that you, you, you didn't feel like there was a lot of incomplete stuff going on, you know? And um, yeah, so there is no way, no normal, right? It's, everybody has their own experience with their loss relationship and it's it, it's okay to feel whatever it is you feel and it, and we celebrate it all right thank you yeah of course okay is kimberly kimberly with us yes i'm here hey kimberly hello I, how are you I'm not very good with Zoom, so I can't really tell like who's with us if there's no video. <laughs> so, yeah, but fine. I thought you were on earlier. So yes. Tell me, how, how do you take care of you? And and tell me a little bit about how, this process for you. Um, the process is going very well. Um, I'm taking a lot of the information that I am using to heal uh, myself back to my kids, so that I'm able to be with them authentically like when I'm talking to them about their grief because I I do um, work with kids um and um 
kind of like what you said earlier, when I'm able to process my feelings and get through all of this, I can show up better in the room for them. So this is really, really helping me to kind of slow down and think and process myself so that I can offer myself better to them. So I am really, really, really enjoying it. Everything that we talk about has been applying to me and I can see my circle like coming around to where I can eventually like you say completed so I'm enjoying the process because it's making me a better counselor um you know for the kids and just for anyone that I come in contact with so um when I did the lost graph I was able to identify a lot of the you know sicknesses that I was telling you about the last time and how something when a, a loss happened then I got sick and then earlier when you were talking about what were your triggers I realized my triggers are not only just a headache but also I have a little I get a little chest pain um and so it was um diagnosis costrandritis I believe is the word and I noticed when I'm triggered like very like strongly I get that and so I know okay to pull back and to maybe lower my voice or stop thinking about it or just um you know that's my trigger when my chest has like the, just a little pain at the top it's a muscle pain but I used to think like I'm having a heart attack or all that but it's actually a muscle pain and so when I don't think about that thing or I figure out how to calm myself down, you know, deep breathing, counting backwards, removing myself, all those other coping things. When I do those things, that chest pain goes away. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's my trigger in a situation when my muscle there gets really tight. I'm really, really, really extremely stressed. And I haven't felt like that way in a long, long time. But when I do, I know that that's what's going on with my body. So for self-care, um, what I like to do, I love music. So I love to listen to all genres of music. So I, I know how to pull myself away and just kind of play my playlist. I like to be by the water. Um, I recently tackled uh, building a pool in the backyard. So I am like super excited about this spring break that's coming. Um, I'm in Houston as well. The only downfall is we're supposed to have a little cooler weather, but I'm going to try to figure out how to still get in. <laughs> enjoy it because I I it's like I have to so I, I I love being near any type of water so I'm gonna figure out that so spring break is gonna be pretty good I'm probably gonna be out there every single day just enjoying that and getting away that's something I've always wanted to do so I'm just thankful that I was able to you know get that project done so um that's my self-care is music and sitting next to the water and just kind of letting the water kind of meditate you know help me meditate and just feeling like I'm like on a resort or something it's not a really big pool but it's something just to just do you know just to have yes so I'm excited about about that so that, that would be my self-care see you know if we all lived closer it could be awesome Ron could barbecue for us <laughs> yeah. and we could go to your house and have a pool party mm -hmm. yep that would be awesome <laughs> oh that is yeah. so great that's great you know, um, Kimberly, it's interesting. I get that chest thing too. Oh. Yep. And if I just touch my chest, yes, I can. And it's like this pain, like, oh my God. I I, I know what you mean. It's like you feel like you're having a heart attack. Yep. Yes. Yes. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm a little worried about myself because I have I get like I have almost. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to revisit my own self-care. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh. Did I forget anybody? Thank you, Kimberly. You're welcome. Anybody else we'll be out? asking you about that next time, Kathy. I know. <laughs> Hold me account. Do not talk to my husband because he'll give you the real deal and it's not pretty. <laughs> awesome, you guys. Well, um, just remember, be good to yourselves. And um, so I'm going to just give you a little deep breathing thing. So this week, when you're working on your graph, you can remember it. It's a really easy breathing exercise, but you have to do it really slowly. Okay. So do it with me. Okay. You guys. Okay. Breathe in through your nose slowly. Out through your mouth. In through your mouth.
and out through your nose. In through your nose. And out through your nose. And in through your mouth. And out through your mouth. Good job. Yeah, it's a good one to remember. Nose, mouth, mouth, nose, 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 mouth, mouth. Okay, the key is do it slowly. All right, you guys, have a good two weeks and we'll see you not next Wednesday, but the week after. Oh, I'm so cool. Wow. Man. I sent okay. the link to I sent the link to you, Kathy. I have it awesome. on I have it on classiccars.com, so there's more pictures on there. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. All right, guys. Have a great two weeks. Be good to yourself. Bye. 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 Kathy, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Bye, Susan. Thank you. Bye, Thank guys. you. Bye. Enjoy.